with Ashley Bone. I'm the director of the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality in the Center for Drugs, and I'm happy to join you today to talk about pharmaceutical quality policy. Today, I'm going to talk about the different types of policy documents. I'll cover some of our ongoing quality policy initiatives and discuss our international harmonization efforts. In terms of policy documents you may be familiar with, we have guidance, we have MAPS, which stands for Manual of Policies and Procedures, and we have Compliance Programs, which you may have heard of by its former name, Compliance Program Guidance. Guidance documents are documents that are prepared for FDA staff, for industry stakeholders, and the public that describe the agency's interpretation of or policy on a regulatory issue. You may not be aware that there are actually regulations that outline our procedures for developing and publishing guidance. They're referred to as the Good Guidance Practices, or GGPs. The GGPs address that an applicant may use an approach other than the one described in our guidance document. However, that alternative approach must comply with the requirements in any relevant statute or regulations. And finally, although guidance documents do not legally bind FDA, they do represent our current thinking. And for that reason, our staff may depart from the recommendations in those guidance documents only with appropriate justification and supervisory concurrence. In terms of the types of guidance documents, we have level one guidances, which set forth an initial interpretation of a new or a significant regulatory requirement. They may describe changes to an earlier policy on that topic, and they may also deal with complex or novel or highly controversial issues. Level one guidances are issued in draft, with a notice in the Federal Register, and with a period for public comment that's usually between 60 and 90 days. The, the Federal Register notice outlines a docket, a public docket, where those comments are submitted and can be viewed by anyone in the public. Once FDA has reviewed those public comments, the guidance may either be reissued as a revised draft or it may move forward and be issued as a final guidance. Level two guidances, by contrast, usually describe existing policy or provide for a minor update or change in an existing policy. And because they are either describing existing policy or a minor change, they are implemented without prior public comment. That said, these guidance documents do have a docket so that the public can comment on a level two guidance at any time, and those comments will be received and reviewed by the agency. So let me speak a little bit more about the types of documents. So a draft you heard me describe is for a new or significantly changed policy. We issue those for public comment and they're not for implementation. On the other hand, a final guidance does represent FDA's current thinking. It will have incorporated public comments that we received when a draft or revised draft was published and they are intended for implementation. Revised draft guidances update a draft where, for example, we've made significant changes to the guidance because of comments received during the public comment period. So we will reissue the guidance as a revised draft and have a second public comment period. And then we have revised final guidances. So where there's a reason to provide an update to a previously final guidance, that's referred to as a revised final. Moving on to MAPS. MAPS are for our internal staff, and they document and describe our policies and procedures. The main type of MAP is a standard MAP, which has no termination date and is made available to the public on our website, and it outlines our policies and procedures in a given area to guide staff in their day-to-day -day work. An interim MAP, on the other hand, is time-limited for three years from the time it's posted. These maps are not available to the public because the content is intended to be temporary. So for example, we may write an interim map to describe the policies and procedures around a pilot program. If the pilot is successful and made permanent, the interim map will be converted to a standard map. 
However, if the pilot did not achieve its objectives and is uh, completed or terminated, then the interim map would be canceled. We also have internal maps. These have no termination date, but they're not made available to the public, generally because the topic of an internal map is of little or no interest to the public. But there are also other topics that are covered in internal maps um, that are maintained internally because either they could provide, pr uh, provide a cybersecurity type of issue if the information provided were made public, or because the information in the map relates to how we conduct investigations or enforcement proceedings. You may not be as familiar with compliance programs, but these documents provide instructions to our FDA staff who conduct investigations and inspections uh, of establishments to ensure compliance with the FD&C Act and other laws that are administered by the agency. These programs include information on approaches to inspection, such as the difference in expectations between a full versus an abbreviated inspection. They address inspection coverage, what will the investigator be expected to look at and to evaluate while they're on site, as well as the regulatory and administrative strategy. Compliance programs are made available to the public on our website, and I would encourage you to review these programs as they can provide important insight on what you might expect during your next FDA inspection. I've listed several examples of the types of compliance programs. The first you see here is for pre-approval inspections. The next three are all related and relate to our routine surveillance inspections, where the first one, 7356.002, drug manufacturing inspections, provides, if you will, an umbrella a document that describes the general approach to surveillance inspections, whereas the documents that have a letter after them, such as 7356.002A, is specific information about how to cover a sterile drug process, and 0.002F is specific to active pharmaceutical ingredients. Next, I want to call your attention to some of the quality guidance that we published in 2019. First, let me note the draft guidance on using the inactive ingredient database, which can be an important developmental tool for folks in the generics uh, arena. I also call your attention to our draft guidance on the USP pending monograph process. USP has information on their website, and this guidance provides information on interacting with FDA in the context of a drug application where there may be a discrepancy between an existing USP monograph that could stand in the way of an approval of a 505B2 or generic application. I also call your attention to the revised draft guidance we published on drug master files last October on the draft guidance on identification of manufacturing establishments and applications, this is about the information you provide to us on your form FDA 356H. And then the last guidance here on transdermal and topical delivery systems, which addresses both innovator and generic products. As you might expect, during the first half of 2020, much of our policy effort has been focused on responding to the COVID-19 crisis. I've listed several of the guidance documents that we've issued and call to your attention the last one on the list and most recently published on GMP considerations for responding to COVID-19 infection in employees in manufacturing facilities. This guidance provides information for manufacturing establishments who may be wondering how to deal with employees who test positive or have been exposed to someone who tests positive for COVID-19 infection in the context of GMP expectations. I've listed here a number of quality guidances that are likely to publish in 2020, and especially those that are final should be of distinct interest to those of you who may be putting together an application, because once final, these guidances are intended for implementation, and so they would provide FDA's current thinking on these topics.
Well, you may be wondering, how do I know what FDA plans to publish in the coming year? Well, FDA actually maintains a public guidance agenda that outlines the new and revised draft guidances that we plan to publish during each calendar year. This is so you can keep an eye out for those guidances as they come out and plan to review and hopefully comment to the public docket. I want to call your attention to a few of these in particular. One is on risk management plans to mitigate the potential for drug shortages. This guidance, when published, will also include information relevant to the requirements in the recently passed CARES Act that includes requirements for certain manufacturers to develop, maintain, and implement risk management plans. You may also be interested in guidance on micro considerations for non-sterile drug products. And the last two guidances here on uh, stability testing of both drug substances and drug products. These are complementary guidances that help to address some of the gaps that we found uh, that are not currently addressed in the ICHQ1 series. I also call your attention to the uh, guidance on drug products administered via enteral feeding tube, as this may also be. In terms of recent maps and compliance programs, <clears throat> we issued a new map, a standard map uh, in 2019 that establishes the Theater Biopharmaceutics Council, which helps to bring additional consistency to decision making in the biopharmaceutics space. And we updated our compliance program on pre approval inspections to reflect the uh, concept of operations that was developed by CEDAR and our Office of Regulatory Affairs in 2018. Next, I want to speak about international harmonization and our efforts in that arena. We find that international harmonization provides some very important opportunities to help reduce regulatory burden for companies who are now operating in a global space and to help incentivize continual improvement and innovation. A recently finalized ICH guidance that you may be familiar with is ICHQ12. But there are several quality related guidances that are under development. ICHQ13 on continuous manufacturing a revision to the current ICHQ2 on analytical procedure validation, and also a new guideline, Q14, on analytical procedure development. There's also a newly established work group now developing Q3E on assessment and control of extractables and leachables. And then a new work item that is slotted to begin later in 2020 is a revision to the existing ICHQ-9 on quality risk management. In recent years, ICH has uh, established some additional opportunities for input into the ICH development process. The first of these is the Quality Discussion Group, or the QDG. Back in June of 2018, ICH uh, Assembly endorsed a reflection paper that discussed the number of steps that could be taken to help advance quality standards to support continual improvement in innovation in manufacturing technologies and approaches. One of the main items that was a recommendation in that reflection paper was to establish the quality discussion group. That quality discussion group does now exist and they provide input into new work items and the order in which new work items should be taken up by ICH. They provide input on existing ICH documents uh, and which should be considered for revision, and they provide input on which quality documents may be uh, needing additional training materials made available. Similarly, ICH has now set up the Informal Generics Discussion Group, or the IGDG. ICH endorsed a reflection paper on further opportunities for harmonization of standards for generic drugs in November of 2018, and already several new work items related to topics that are of particular interest to the generic drug industry have been undertaken. FDA also participates in PICS, or the Pharmaceutical Inspector Cooperation Scheme. PICS is a uh, collection of regulators from around the world uh, in particular, the inspectorate pieces of those regulators 
uh, with the intent of harmonizing uh, expectations around good manufacturing practice and inspections to evaluate GMP compliance. One of their most recent documents that may be of particular interest, especially given ICHQ-12, is the draft recommendation paper on how to evaluate or demonstrate the effectiveness of a PQS in relation to risk-based change management. This document, as well as the ICH reflection papers mentioned here, are available on the respective organization's websites. So let me just spend a few minutes talking about ICHQ-12 which is entitled Technical and Regulatory Considerations for Pharmaceutical Product Lifecycle Management. This guideline was finalized by ICH after a five-year effort in November of 2019, and ICH converted the expert working group into an implementation working group, which is now developing training materials that are intended for both assessors and inspectors and for use in all regions. And ICH is, is uh, working in collaboration with PICS on those training materials. From an FDA perspective, uh, this guideline will be published as a final FDA guidance this summer, and implementation of the full guideline will begin with that publication. The scope is quite broad. It addresses innovator drugs, generics, biosimilars, and also addresses CEDAR and cber led combination products. Importantly, the Q12 guideline and the tools therein can be used for both new products and already marketed products. And as you may have seen on a prior slide, FDA has been developing a guidance with details of implementation in the U.S. regulatory system. And we hope that will publish later this year. Just to spend a couple of moments on some of the key tools and enablers in Q12, one that you may have heard about is established conditions, and use of this tool offers applicants an opportunity to get clarity regarding certain aspects of their application, including which elements of the control strategy must be reported if changed, as well as on the flip side, which elements of the control strategy can then be managed under the pharmaceutical quality system without needing reporting to the regulator. It provides clarity on how much flexibility exists to make changes to an identified established condition and how to report those changes when they're made. Overall, established conditions provide an important way to achieve additional regulatory flexibility in managing post-approval CMC changes around the world. ICHQ-12 also includes post-approval change management protocols, which are the same as what we refer to in the United States as comparability protocols. Q12 also includes the product life cycle management document, which is a one-stop shop, if you will, a single place to include all of the information related to um, the post-approval stage of the life cycle. And it also includes structured approaches for frequent CMC post-approval changes to provide a mechanism for changes uh, to already marketed products that may not have established conditions in place. So in conclusion, FDA develops policy documents for both industry stakeholders as well as our internal staff. Many of these documents are available for your review. And our public guidance agenda can provide insight into new and revised guidance that's in development for the coming year that's published usually once, or, and in some cases, twice a year. So please keep an eye out for that on our website. And finally, developing guidance that is internationally harmonized provides an important opportunity to reduce regulatory burden for industry and incentivize continual improvement and further harmonization. Thank you very much for your time.